technical terminology. So, um, so imagine a mushroom in the forest or something, and then a spore falls on a leaf or a log or something like that. And then, uh, so once certain environmental conditions arise that are favorable for the spore, then it'll germinate a little, a little tube made out of these, um, like the most basic components of any fungus. So these are called hyphae. They're single cells that are hollow, and they kind of grow in these chains like this of hollow cells. And then once two compatible spores germinate their hyphae and they kind of meet each other, they can fuse. Um, and then, and then once once they fuse, they're sharing their nuclei. They're sharing their genetic material, and then that's what kind of allows them to grow into this uh, sometimes really vast mycelium mat. Um, so yeah, this is the, the mycelium is like the main part of the mushroom, right? This is what's growing. Um, it's it's uh, it's what's you know kind of eating and uh, doing the bulk of the work. The mushroom is just there to make spores to make mycelium. Um, so again, so the mycelium can grow for uh, months and months. It can grow for years. Um, some of the oldest and biggest organisms are mycelial pests. Um, and then, uh, yeah, once it, once uh, again, certain environmental conditions arise, like you know, it's rainy and spores can germinate really well, then that stimulates the mycelium to form mushrooms. So the mushroom starts as a little hyphal knot. It's just a super compressed, condensed uh, ball, basically, of mycelium. And then uh, over the course of a few days, those little hyphal knots form into mushrooms. So any mushroom is just made out of hyper-condensed mycelium. So once it's at this point right here, the mushroom is basically fully formed. And then uh, over the course of, like I said, maybe five or seven days, it's basically just pumped full of water and other kind of cytoplasmic juices in the rest of this big mushroom. So yeah, it can go really fast. Like this time lapse was probably taken over the course of a week from start to finish. Um, and then over, so over the course of the actual mushroom's life cycle, it's gonna produce billions of spores a day. And, Mushrooms don't last long, but billion, billions of spores per day over the course of weeks really uh, adds up. So. All right, so now that we're kind of all on the same page about mycelium, um, we can start to talk about how these mycelial mats kind of, uh, they are physically connecting plants and other organisms in the forest, and they're just a super, um, instrumental part of any ecosystem. So uh, we'll just watch a few minutes of this clip. Um, Dennis explains this really well. of connectivity, which is essentially what the brain is. But there are, the ecosystems are the same thing. The trees in an old growth forest are all connected underground by complex networks of, called mycorrhizal, fungal uh, plant uh, uh, symbioses. So that they are communication systems for the entire forest. The entire forest is in some way works like a brain because it has this neural network. We just don't see it that way because we're we're not used to thinking of neural networks of that size. A neural network has to be contained in a, in a brain. Not the case, not true. And there's really interesting work going on about these forest ecosystem communication systems. So some threat comes to the forest at one edge all the trees in the forest know, know immediately what's going on and start cranking out chemicals to meet the challenge. You know, so uh, that's where you see intelligence manifest. Neural networks are all over the place. And those 
for what you need, but they don't have to be linked to neural systems as we understand them. Um, the fungi actually, the fungi transported more sugars to the to the tree in deep shade than the one in cool shade, and it kind of exhibits this uh, declining relationship like, between those different conditions. So this is just one physical example of like how uh, you know nutrient transfer can be modulated through the use of fungi in our forests, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, and so this study is actually done with, uh, it's like the same species and same continuous mycelial mat growing between a oak tree and then these three different uh, birch trees. So this, this nutrient transfer is happening between different species of trees too, so it just kind of uh, makes you wonder what, what, uh, what's happening in the forest. Cool, so one of the coolest applications of fungi um, and kind of like their purpose in nature is uh, micro-restoration. So they kind of act as these ambassadors to balance nutrients as we saw on the last slide, but they can also work to remediate um, biocontaminated soils. Uh, this is a study done on diesel contaminated soils. So they took four different piles, all saturated with uh, petroleum products. Um, they left one as a control, treated two with enzymes and bacteria, and one with fungi. Um, the three other piles that weren't treated with fungi uh, after eight weeks were just dark and dead and desolate. Nothing really changed about them. They were stinky, oily piles of dirt. Um, but with the pile that was inoculated with mushroom spawn in eight weeks, um, it became an oasis of life. So first, uh, mushrooms started growing, attracting insects. Insects lay eggs, attracting birds, and then within a matter of weeks, it's a whole new ecosystem and uh, uh, otherwise like contaminated lifeless soil, which is pretty amazing. Um, it reduced the hydrocarbons from 20,000 parts per million to 200 in um, eight weeks, so that's like fully remediated soil as for our other techniques for remediating soil, um, you know, didn't do anything, so uh, that's pretty amazing, I think. Um, and one of the coolest things is that the mycelium kind of acts like a sponge, so it soaks up the oil first, and then it produces enzymes to break down the hydrocarbons. So it's actually not just you know <clears throat> removing it from the soil, but it's breaking it down into useful carbon for other plants. And stuff. You can also use mycelium as a biological filter. So um, a big problem in agriculture is you know pesticides and E. coli and chlorophyll bacteria uh, running off into our water uh, systems. So one thing that mycelium can do, the network uh, can actually trap these bacteria and pesticides and then break them down. So what's commonly done is you plant um, these like burlap sacks colonized with mycelium along watershed areas and it actually will <coughs> trap those contaminants and break them down, um, helping us to prevent harmful bacteria and uh, pesticides getting into our water. Um, you can see it done here along the edge of a farm, this is kind of what it would look like in practice. And we're going to try to set up a project for the club, if you're interested, to actually do this and go set up at a local farm and, you know, take water samples and see what effects it actually has, which will be very fun. Yeah, and I think uh, this is like a super interesting area of micro-restoration because uh, this problem of pesticide and uh, kind of like uh, animal waste contamination in, in our water systems is like a really ubiquitous problem and there's no good solutions for it. So uh, yeah, it can be really cheap and easy to make a whole bunch of bunker spawn and just you know, plant it in, in, um, in the way of these streams and just have a really cheap, effective biological filter. And one of the coolest parts is like mushrooms, we grow them on waste, so you know, anytime we're like undertaking uh, mycological Project. We're using otherwise waste material to do something beneficial, which is So, kind of, uh, kind of related to the pesticide pollution, um, is uh, the decline and the kind of basically there's a, a bee epidemic. So, um, native bees and honeybees are. Uh, their populations are rapidly declining, um, in part due to uh, the industrial use of pesticides and also um, partly because of the 
commercial farming of bees um, just for agricultural uses. Um, so, um, so bees reishi. So, and this is this is like the first and one of the only studies of its kind. So this is like a really interesting, um, really promising area of research. And uh, yeah, this is just the beginning. I think so much more can be done with this. And um, bees are just such an important part of any ecosystem, um, but especially for people, like uh, a huge portion of our, our food supply relies on bees. And uh, it's kind of really, can be really scary to think about how badly the bee populations are hurting right now. So, yeah, I think I think definitely more needs to be put into this this side of. Things. Cool. Another aspect of micro restoration um, of fungi is mycopesticides or entomopathogenic fungi. You might have heard of this mushroom cordyceps. Um, in nature, it attracts termites and actually uh, colonizes their body with mycelium and then. All, the termite like crawls up a twig and gets mummified and then a mushroom pops out of its head. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty popular in literature right now just because you know, that's a pretty crazy thing that happens. Um, but there's really promising uh, applications for this. Uh, mycologists have taken strains of this uh, mushroom and actually turned it into like an industrial micro-pesticide, so to uh, use against carpenter ants in your house and stuff like that. Um, it's really promising for replacing like our chemical pesticides that we use right now and they're super selective so you can find a mushroom that will only kill like certain insects instead of just you know decimating entire populations everything um, from harmful chemical pesticides yeah and this is just another another aspect that can have huge uh, have a huge impact on the agricultural industry and the same thing we were talking about with the, the overuse of industrial pesticides. Um, you can produce these for super cheap and like Patrick was saying, um, a lot of these um, insect pathogens are super host specific. So they only grow on one type of insect and you can't get them to grow on any other type of insect. So that's uh, really important if you're trying to release like a, a biopesticide into the environment. You don't want it to kill you know every insect. You, you only want it to target the Cool. So one of the things I'm most interested in is this uh, topic, micro-materials. It's relatively new, um, but there's more and more companies coming out producing mushroom clothing, mushroom phones, um, and all sorts of stuff. But it's a great way to grow sustainable building materials. Like I said earlier, we grow mushrooms on agricultural waste. Um, and most of our materials that we use commercially today, plastics and phones and stuff like that, um, and they're one of the highest carbon emissions uh, like worldwide. Um, so obviously taking mycelium and growing it on agricultural waste, we're actually sequestering more of that carbon on our natural resources. You know, it's being stored in the mycelium instead of being mined and released into the atmosphere. Um, so that's really awesome. Uh, and high fare are actually super strong and lightweight. Um, more research kind of has to be done before we can start making buildings out of it and stuff. But as far as things like uh, foam and insulation and like thin pliable materials that we use like leather and stuff, it's showing extremely high uh, you know applications uh, to replace that stuff like you can see here aerial mycelium growing on uh, probably wood chips or sawdust you know some waste material um, and this can actually be cured and maintain that like flexible form structure um, and then some other cool things like chairs being made out of mycelium or this building is made out of mycelial bricks um, and then <coughs> There's this super cool mycologist named Trad Cotter. He's like super into um, launching new mycological projects at home and stuff. And he came up with this idea of kind of like a self-healing structure. So he partnered with this brick maker and made clay bricks um, and actually incorporated sawdust and mycelium into it and colonized it. And the idea is you soak the bricks in water before you build your structure or whatever, and then the mycelium actually grows together and fuses the bricks. You know, and over time, like if the wall gets damaged or something, that mycelium is still alive and will actually grow and heal itself. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in projects like this, uh, check out Trad Cotter. He's like super cool. And, I don't know, has tons of projects that you can attempt at home or just like inspiring stuff uh, to explore this new science of micro materials. 
Um, and then kind of the last main topic that we're going to talk about is uh, using mushrooms as a medicine. So um, because of depression and anxiety, um, Alzheimer's and dementia. So it's a really, really powerful um, untapped potential there with, with lion's mates. And actually, a side note, um, in, uh, in, in Europe, people have been using lion's mane for like almost 50 years as, uh, as like a standard treatment for MS and other neurological disorders. So uh, yeah, I just, I think there, there's so much more we, we need to be doing with lion's mane. Uh, and yeah, there's, like I said, there's only a handful of research on most of this stuff. So uh, just, there needs to be a lot more resources put into all of these applications. Um, another really uh, potent and popular uh, medicinal mushroom is reishi. So this mushroom specifically is one of the mushrooms that has been used for um, many thousands of years in traditional Chinese medicine, um, mostly for uh, um, just uh, generally supporting your immune system, also for helping with respiratory issues like uh, uh, coughs and colds and stuff like that. Um, and reishi is another unique mushroom because it, it has this really strong um, papata protective um, characteristic, which means that it, um, it protects your liver health and, and kind of uh, stimulates your liver to produce the right ratios of enzymes that, that it needs to be healthy. Um, yeah, and more on this slide, um, it's important to note that like all mushrooms, they kind of have this medicinal benefit of immunomodulating and anti-inflammatory uh, properties. So their cell walls are actually made up of uh, beta-glucans, which help your body produce, um, or they're beneficial, they're complex polysaccharides that help your immune system regulate itself. Um, they can upregulate or downregulate it if you have an overactive immune system, which is pretty awesome. Um, and yeah, they're all anti-inflammatory and just good for beautiful health. So I think it's pretty Um, and then I think this is the, the last mushroom we're going to get into for now, um, but the cordyceps mushroom, um, we mentioned it earlier, this is the mushroom that parasitizes insects. Um, most of the cordyceps used for uh, like supplements is uh, this species cordyceps militaris, which actually um, can be cultivated on grains and other substrates that aren't uh, insects. Um, but yeah, this is a this is another really powerful mu mushroom. Um, it it's unique in that it has really high levels of uh, adenosine. Which, uh, if you know what ATP is, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So this is kind of a, serves as a precursor to ATP. So um, so that's it, it kind of uh, it can increase your stamina and help you uh, help your. Uh, help your body absorb more oxygen, like at the cellular cellular level. Um, so this is a really popular mushroom with with uh, professional athletes. Um, yeah, and then it also has the same kind of anti-tumor, anti, -tumor, anti um, uh, or immunomodulating effects and co cholesterol regulating effects that are kind of a fundamental benefit of any mushroom. And yeah, that's just. Uh, that's just three of the big ones. There are there are so many medicinal mushrooms for that have different benefits, and uh, there are also um, so many benefits that we don't know about uh, uh, that come from the mushrooms that we're already using. Um, uh, not to mention the uh, many millions of mushroom species that we haven't even discovered yet. So there's uh, a huge reservoir of untapped medicinal uh, potential with mushrooms um, so yeah if you're if you're interested in learning more about the, the medicinal side of stuff um, there's a really good book Myco Medicinals by Paul Stamets um, and then these two websites the International Journal of Medicinal Mushrooms and mushroomreferences.com um, they have uh, tons of really good mushroom literature and info on the medicinal stuff All right, the last mushroom that we're going to talk about in medicine, medicinal applications, are psilocybin mushrooms. Um, 
Many of you may already be familiar, but these are still the Schedule I status in uh, the United States, um, meaning that they have high potential for abuse um, and no medical benefits, um, which if you're anxiety and PTSD, especially under the supervision of like a, a trained professional, um, given in a controlled setting. So uh, many times like the patient would have eye covers on and listen to music under uh, the guidance of, of two professionals. Um, but yeah, there's uh, the kind of how it's speculated that this works is through epi epigenetic neurogenesis. So this is kind of your brain normally, um, and then this is your brain on psilocybin. And what it does is it actually helps your brain um, form new neural connections and kind of reroute um, the neural pathways that you already have. So finding new ways to like work through um, anxiety and depression and PTSD potentially. Um, and also just uh, supporting overall brain health like in the long term, kind of like Lyme's main, it promotes uh, neural growth and uh, new neural pathways, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um just another huge frontier of uh, research that needs to be done. And yeah, like he was saying, the Schedule One legal status is kind of, uh, it's like the opposite of the truth, right? Like mushrooms are kind of, uh, they have like uh, a high potential for abuse. Uh, I, they, they have like the opposite effect. Like you take mushrooms and then you don't want to do them again for a while, um, which is, really unique for any sort of pharmaceutical drugs, um, really unheard of. And also, I mean, no no means for safe use under medical supervision. There, there are already published studies and tons of uh, clinical research going on that, that shows the uh, exact opposite of that statement. So it's just, uh, there are, there are uh, the, the psychedelic legalization movement is, uh, moving pretty fast. So I think that legal status will, will change um, in the next you know handful of years. But yeah, I think it's another really important uh, aspect that we don't, we don't have really good solutions for things like treatment resistant depression and PTSD. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, really, really crazy that uh, this medicine is kind of uh, you know, restricted this stuff so um, and then yeah we'll just end with a few more uh, really fascinating mushroom facts so um, another reason that mushrooms are so important for any sort of kind of uh, uh, ecosystem is uh, they're one of the first successional organisms that you see grow in environment so imagine like a a really rocky, dry, um, kind of desolate ecosystem. Um, there are fungi that can grow in these rocks and physically break them down, and, as well as chemically break them down. So the hyphal tips um, can exert a really high pressure. And like I said, they can physically break the rocks apart. And they also um, produce compounds called oxalates that will bind with uh, with certain things in rocks, like calcium and stuff, that will, um, yeah, like chemically break down the rocks into calcium oxalate and other, other stuff. Yeah, and so, um, at, like we said at the beginning, um, mushrooms uh, can produce billions and billions of spores. There's some uh, polypore mushrooms that will produce uh, many trillions of spores over its life cycle, over its lifespan. Um, and uh, the and growing your own food, um, you can basically just grow. Uh, you can even do this with edible mushrooms. Like this experiment was done with oyster mushrooms. Um, so you can grow oyster mushrooms in wood chips at kind of like mulch in your garden, um, and then it it kind of helps the soil retain more moisture and nutrients. So you can see this Brussels sprout on the left was grown without oyster mushroom mycelium and the one on the right with and it's just a way taller bigger um, bigger produce and just way healthier yeah so that's that's really fun um, and then uh, it said that if you were to kind of unravel all of the hyphae in the soil into a straight line then there would be 300 miles of fungal mycelium under each footstep so 
Um, and then I briefly mentioned this before, the, the largest known organism and likely one of the oldest is a 2,000 acre mycelial mat um, of the honey mushroom in Oregon. Really massive. All right, and then um, just before we wrap up, I want to talk about um, the Fungi Foundation. Um, so I recommend that you guys uh, go to their website and see more about what they're doing. I think it's a really important nonprofit. Um, one of the biggest projects that I think you all should uh, uh, read about and sign this uh, petition is the Fauna Flora Funga Project. So um, this is just a, an effort to uh, intentionally include fungi in, in legal conservation frameworks. So um, historically, fungi have just been kind of thrown in with plants. And when these conservation efforts are um, you know, carried out in, in, in practice, then the fungi kind of get forgotten. So this is just an effort to include them as you know, in critical organisms in their own right, instead of just kind of lumping them in with plants. Yeah. Um, and then one last thing is uh, this is a really good way to get involved if you're um, really interested in mushrooms and already out there collecting and observing and stuff. So um, the fungal diversity survey. Um, they have, you can go to their website and check out a whole bunch of their challenges and projects and stuff. Um, but the main way you can get involved is if you use iNaturalist, um, you can join this Fundus Biodiversity Database on iNaturalist, and then you can upload all of your iNaturalist observations to that database and uh, help contribute to many different uh, research efforts. So, um, and also, if you're interested in any of the, uh, go through our plans for the rest of the semester and maybe get some ideas from you guys on some activities that you guys want to see. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, so we've got a couple, uh, a couple fun events planned uh, coming up here shortly. So our first uh, kind of big event for the year is a foraging trip. And that's going to happen this Sunday uh, at 10 a.m. Um, so yeah, we'll go on a foray. We're going to kind of just all go out of the woods together, like learn how to identify wild mushrooms um, and kind of figure out like, you know, what we can pick, what can be eaten, um, all sorts of stuff. And just appreciating the awesome fungal diversity we have here in the Rocky Mountains. So um, we've got a sign up. Yeah, here's the sign up. Thing. So we'll probably drive up to like Netherland. We'll meet around 10 a.m. Um, and then uh, the link is also on the Discord on the yeah. events tab. You can click and it's you can also find it there. Yeah, it's on Discord. Uh, if you guys don't have Discord, uh, we definitely suggest uh, getting it. We've got invite links here as well. Um, yeah, and then just uh, fill out the sign up sheet. Yeah. And, and then I'll, I'll put that back up. Then. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then if you're interested in growing your own mushrooms as well, uh, we have a grow workshop uh, coming together for you guys. So we'll teach you how to grow lion's mane for your own use, um, oysters, all sorts of other different species provided by Chris. Um, everything's totally free. Uh, we're going to get uh, some sign up stuff we kind of figured out for that. It's going to be in two sessions. So one's going to be like an inoculation phase. Uh, and then you'll wait for that mycelium to kind of grow and get a little more robust. And then you'll put them into big bags like this, and that's where you'll actually grow your mushrooms.